Hello everyone. This is Shobha from CNS and welcome to the third episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, a special series of online interviews held every fortnight with leaders in the Pacific, in the Asia Pacific rather, on the overarching theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific, 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities as they are. This is also the theme of the forthcoming 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, APCR SHR 10. For the benefit of our audience, these dialogues will be streamed live on Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. In today's episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we have with us Ms. Tomoko Fukuda, Regional Director of International Planned Parenthood Federation or IPPF as we more commonly call it for the east and southeast asia and oceania region welcome ms fukuda we are really honored to have you with us today tomoko the theme of asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights is srhr in asia pacific sdg 2030 vision and the 2020 realities where are we in the region on srhr in terms of the 2020 realities and the 2030 goals and targets yes uh, in terms of progress on srhr in this region i think we have made uh, great progress in terms of maternal and newborn health in terms of contraceptive awareness family planning hiv aids also but um i feel like there is still a long ways to go in terms of reaching SRHR in the full range and full spectrum of SRHR especially in terms of providing quality services to all um there's a lot of issues that have been neglected or not enough uh input has been put into for example SRHR for young people adolescents um SGBB uh preventing unsafe abortions and accessing safe abortion services emergency contraception uh, also in terms of SRHR in the life cycle um also with young in the younger ages within terms of menstruation maybe in the older ages also in terms of menopause uh, also not just in terms of preventing unplanned pregnancy but also for the couples who are wanting to have children in, in terms of infertility these are kind of areas that we haven't really uh, launched into much yet in terms of SRHR also um sexual rights and the right to control uh one's own body and also uh, the whole discussion around sexuality and um diversity and sexual orientations and gender identities uh, these are things that have not really been uh, looked into full in relation to what we have achieved in terms of maternal and child health care or family planning services so yes i think we have achieved quite a lot but there is such a wide range of issues that are still left in this region um and also in terms of um inequity i think uh, a lot of the countries in our asian pacific region they have developed economically so we are all um perhaps leading better lives in terms of development but that does not equal to how we have progressed with SRHR in the full range so um and in terms of uh, populations that we have that have sort of fallen through the cracks perhaps uh migrant workers or internally displaced people or undocumented uh citizens or uh within societies for example unmarried single parents uh, we've just had an issue recently in japan where unmarried single mothers could not receive the same benefits as an someone who had been married and was divorced or separate uh, or his her his or her partner had passed away so these kinds of inequalities uh are there within our community so uh, i feel there's a lot that we still have to tackle in terms of inequalities as well okay very, very rightly said and that uh, that political aspect of it that what are the the laws and uh, how they are governed as you took that example of japan just now 
Uh, why do you think is uh, universal and rights based access to SRHR uh, information and services key to achieving the SDGs? Yes, so uh, with the um, with the SDGs, I think we saw a great uh, transition from the MDGs when the MDGs was uh, focusing on maternal mortality, and when we shifted to launched into the era of the SDGs, uh, SRHR has a clear spot and space within the SDGs. We are in SDGs three with a clear target on, SD, on SRH, so sexual and reproductive health. And then in SDGs five, we also have a, one specific target on achieving sexual reproductive health and rights. So I think in the SDGs, we have a clear a space with regards to SRHR. And SDGs three and five are sort of like the key fundamental goals of the SDGs. Um, women are 50%, a little bit more than 50% of the population. If women do not have quality of health care, and if they are not healthy, if they do not have well being, if their human rights are not upheld, how can the whole population? develop economically or achieve better education for all or achieve any of the other SDG goals. So uh, very clearly, I think SDGs 5 and then SDGs 3, these are the key fundamental driving forces for SDGs. Therefore, um, it is essential that SRHR, who has the key kind of a space within these two goals, become the fundamental drivers to achieve the SDGs. As you have rightly said that the SRHR are, is an important component of SDGs and that uh, SDGs have to be achieved by 2030. So we have less than 130 months left as of today to achieve that target. And also the Nairobi statement on ICPD 25 last year uh, commits us to universal access to SRHR information and services. How can we accelerate progress? Can you just pinpoint some of the main challenges or some of the main obstacles uh, in reaching these targets? So, um, uh, yes, there, I think some of the uh, key obstacles um, may be that, um, well, for example, for us in Asia and the Pacific, especially, uh, people have sort of assumed that once a country is developing economically, the SRHR issues will also be solved accordingly. But uh, I think uh, as we have seen cases in various countries, in, including the countries where I am from in Japan, um, economic development does not equal SRHR. And I can tell you very loud and clear, it is not the same for women in Japan. So. Um, I think there's a kind of assumption that um, SRHR is not so much of a, well, donor kind of, donor interests have shifted from Asia and the Pacific because the countries have economically developed. I think that there's a, a challenge for us here to raise the, our voice to say that SRHR is still very much an issue in in varying forms now in all of our countries in Asia and the Pacific and that we need continued donor commitment to tackle these issues. So um, the ICPD plus 25 in Nairobi, I think that was a great opportunity for governments to come together. And um, IPPF has done a, a survey to see how, uh, what, what these commitments look like. And we've uh, seen that uh, there have been among the 25 countries that is under um, IPPF, uh, the East and Southeast and Oceania region, um, many of the countries have actually made commitments towards achieving uh, some aspects of SRHR or another. For example, um, 12 countries committed towards uh, comprehensive sexuality education, um, five countries committed to gender equality, um, 14 countries committed to sexual uh, SGBV, uh, 12 countries committed to uh, universal health coverage. So there are uh, some types of uh, commitments there. Uh, I think our challenge would be that um, not to make promises 
just as promises? How do we ensure that governments really do move towards delivering to these promises? Uh, also, the promises made are, some of them are not very clear or they're vague in terms of promise deliverable. How do we push governments to make commitments that are more tied to deliverables and are more clear on what kind of outcomes they are responsible for? Um, and so for this, I think we need to, um, uh, for us, we need to come together from different multi-stakeholders. So, uh, for example, from you from the media or from the United Nations or from international non-government organizations, also local non-government organizations, to come together to have, to create a mechanism for monitoring progress and a platform where we can raise our voice collectively to push governments uh, towards uh, contributing to this. And I think this needs to come hand in hand with our push for universal health coverage so that uh, we have a combined effort among uh, NGOs working in this sector towards our government. Okay, thank you. You took the example of Japan. And I think that is true of other countries as well in this region. Uh, where economic development is not going hand in hand with uh, particularly gender equity and gender equality. And I think, uh, as, as you have rightly pointed out, that is where we have to look in more. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes the picture to me really looks very dismal, you know, where, whether we are going to achieve it. But uh, can you share some best practice examples uh, from East and Southeast Asia and Oceania regions, countries who are doing better than others, could you share some examples, please? Yes, so um, some examples, for example, um, our member association in Hong Kong, um, the, the Hong Kong Family Planning Association, uh, let's say 20 years back, they were uh, supporting more for family planning and contraceptives. So they had the slogans that said, uh, two, is in, uh, two is enough or, their kind of logo had a family of two children. And, and that was in the past, but as, um, as the countries have developed and um, now countries like uh, Hong Kong, uh, also including China, South Korea, Japan, we are aging very fast. And the interest of the population is also in terms of, um, of having children. Uh, the Family Planning Association of Hong Kong has sort of widened their SRHR uh, services that are being provided to include subfertility services and counseling. And their message is totally about choice. So it is about um, when and how many children to have or how, how much or how, how much you want to space and being able to access the full range of services from contraceptives to subfertility services. And also looking at menopause, also looking at cervical cancer, also looking at a wide range of sexual reproductive health uh, topics in one clinic setting. So I think the, the Family Planning uh, Association in Hong Kong is a good example of how um, we can transform our uh, services to fit the needs of the people and how, in accordance to how the country also develops. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, what about uh, some countries where more needs to be done? Uh, can you give us some examples in this uh, region? Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, some countries who are really lagging behind uh, the mm -hmm. others and what's ne what needs to be done more there? So I think, um, I think there, not there are not any specific countries that are lagging behind but there are countries that have different issues so for example um, within like thailand cambodia vietnam indonesia malaysia uh, one of the key issues now is about migrant workers and uh, people will move from this country to another country sometimes they are connected by land sometimes they are not but that does not stop people from moving from one country to another to 
in search of work and they will end up in sometimes um, as a house home care workers. Uh, sometimes they will be working in factories, sometimes they'll be working in plantations, but uh, in many cases, these migrant workers are not uh, properly registered or documented. They may not have the full access to health care in terms of uh, universal health care policies or or insurances that are available for people who are in who are residents and nationals of that country. Um, in some in some countries, there's even a move to have kind of an agreement between countries so that if somebody is under an insurance in country A, if this person moves to country B, the insurance from country A will continue to support the health of this person in the new country. But these kinds of systems are not yet in place. So in many cases, um, they do not have the access to the health services because of cost. Sometimes uh, language can be a barrier. And if language is a barrier, um, if they have an unplanned pregnancy, perhaps they may be sent back to their countries. So uh, I think, uh, Work evolving migrant workers is, is an emerging issue that uh, still needs to be uh, tackled here. Um, in terms of the Pacific Islands, uh, there is still a great uh, need there. Uh, uh, the sheer difficulty of the geography in reaching countries where they have so many islands and people live on islands who are, which is far away, uh, it is difficult to reach them. The sheer geographic distance is a difficulty. Um, there's a lack of human resources. Uh, so SRHR in the Pacific continues to be a challenge. And uh, I think uh, we need to focus also our attention there. Okay, yes, very rightly said. Uh, uh, how can conferences like APCR SHR 10 help advance the commitments made at the Nairobi summit last year and the SDGs uh, in 2015. How can such conferences help us? Yes, so uh, I think uh, conferences like SRH, uh, this APCR SHR, this is a platform where we can uh, come together as people working in SRHR who share the same passion and we can share our ideas and experiences to to look for better ways that we can work together. And uh, when, you, when you're when you back in your own country, sometimes you can feel lonely uh, if, you're, if you don't have uh, so many SRHR colleagues to sort of join forces with. Uh, I remember always going to big conferences like this and feeling very much energized and very, very much empowered to do something when I go back to my country because of all the energy that I get from the other people that I meet at the conference. So uh, I think definitely um, this is a conference like this is where we can uh, join forces and um, look for ways that we can work better together and also ensure that it sort of reflects back to when we go back to our countries. Um, I think also conferences like this will enable us to raise our voice with, in terms of SRHR. Um, all of us can raise our voices in our respective countries here and there, but at conferences like this are chances for us to um, raise our issues on the media or make joint statements together that will be presented to governments. And so it will be an opportunity for us to make ourselves more visible. So I think this is also uh, one way that um, APCR SHR can um, help us in this region. Mm -hmm. And we are really glad to have you with us today for one more reason, because yes. International Women's Day is just around the corner. Yes. And uh, this year's theme is an equal world is an enabled world. So mm -hmm. uh, what is your message for International Women's Day for this year? 
So uh, uh, I really like the, this uh, theme for this year's International Women's Day. Um, if a woman is not enabled to make choices about her own body, how is she able to become equal in this world? I think um, it, it says a lot about uh, empowering a woman. And I think the word enable also shows us that um, to be able to take action, it is not only, it, it, it is a wide range of issues. It is about being aware of, of the opportunities. It is being uh, given the correct uh, information about it. It is also enabling a woman to be able to take action on whatever choices that she makes. And uh, I think for us, we need to be very sensitive and careful on to know what are the difficulties and what are the barriers that are preventing a woman from making these choices. And once you once you've being able to make the choices yourself, sometimes it's difficult to understand or to know what are the difficulties? What is it that is preventing a woman to make choices or take action? What are the enabling factors? And uh, I think we need to become much more sensitive uh, to the difficulties and issues that women in various situations face. And, and then the issues will be so wide um, so that we can make sure that we do uh, tailor our interventions so that it is appropriate for each woman. So, um, especially in terms of leaving no one behind, I think it is very crucial that we try to find the difficulties and differences in, uh, in all the women. So it's not, we cannot say women <laughs> and put them all 51% of the population in one basket. And they are in the different cultures, different social norms, different family situations. And enabling is, is not as easy as just one word. It is a lot of efforts and multifaceted efforts that need to be there in order to, to make a woman uh, be able to make choices and be able to um, yeah, and, uh, in an equal world. Yeah. Very right. Yeah. So uh, anything else you would like to share to Mopo, which uh, might have slipped from my mind and you would uh, like anything yeah. else? Yes. yes. So uh, I think uh, this, uh, this conference comes at a good time. And uh, I joined IPPF uh, East and Southeast Asia region uh, last June. And one of the things that I've been looking at is how wide and vast uh, SRHR is now for us in this region. Uh, I think uh, globally, we and we have we have a wide variety <laughs> of SRH issues. May I, if I may say, and uh, I think we could become leaders uh, in the world in terms of how we address the different SRHR issues that I mentioned at the very beginning. For example, SGBV or or diversity in sexual orientation and gender uh, identities. Maybe these are areas that uh, we could lead on. Um, also, uh, in terms of leaving no one behind, uh, looking at SRHR for persons with disabilities, uh, even looking at, for example, comprehensive sexuality education for young people with um, disabilities, and not only physical disabilities, but also with psychological issues or mental issues. So there are many different areas that I think uh, we need to tackle, as I said in the beginning, but also an area that, that we could actually lead on in terms of uh, globally as well. And uh, so now my work here in IPPF has been that uh, in IPPF, we have been focused on family planning because that was sort of our core and fundamental work and we still value that as our sort of big master pillar but it is our challenge now uh, for, to see how our member associations can also diversify our services in terms of SRHR in the life cycle 
and also in terms of the aging societies in um, not only South Korea, Japan, and China, but also uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and some of the other countries are also uh, aging very fast. So uh, these are some of the new areas, I think, that are coming up in this region. And um, if uh, the conference could become a platform where we can discuss these issues and um, give ideas on how we think we could go forward from our respective worlds, uh, I think that would really help us to push SRHR in this region. Okay, so just uh, maybe just you can recap the little bit in terms of your message for APCR SHR 10. Mm -hmm. What so, would you, yes. Yeah, so I, I hope that um, this, this APCR SHR will become a platform where we uh, share our ideas and um, we also share our passion. I think this is where we will be able to get a lot of energy from our other colleagues and uh, sort of renew our energy to forward SRHR in the next, next year so that we are sure that we reach the goals of SDGs together with SRHR. Okay. Thank you very much, Tomoko. And uh, we now open the question and answer session. I now invite the listeners for their comments and questions. If you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your questions and comment in the chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen. If you wish to speak, please unmute yourself and then ask your question or raise the virtual hand. And if you are watching it on Facebook, you can leave a comment there. Uh, we already have a few questions with us. So I will begin with a question from Rita Vidyadana, who is former editor of Jakarta Post and still writes for it. She's a very senior journalist from Indonesia, and she's also part of the APCAT Media Asia Pacific Regional Media Network. And she has uh, many questions for Indonesia, but I think they are pertinent to other countries as well. Uh, for her first question is, what are the most worrisome issues faced in the field of SRHR in Asian region? Maybe the top, uh, the top ones, the worrisome issues. That is her first question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think the worrisome issue still remains to be around unplanned uh, pregnancies because um, we still have a high incidence of, uh, for example, unplanned uh, pregnancies in young people. And this has resulted to uh, what, it, what uh, they are calling like baby dumping in Malaysia where babies are born, but they are thrown away. Uh, it, Japan is no exclusion. And we've had uh, in, a lot of incidences where high school girls will have, have their children have a baby in their school. And they wouldn't even know that they were pregnant until they had the baby at the school. And then they would just leave the baby there to die. So. I think still one of the biggest issues that we do need to tackle is making sure that um, women do have access to uh, contraceptives and they are able to make choices about their um, bodily autonomy and um, uh, with regards to their fertility. Uh, a key, key topic or key issue in relation to this is uh, the comprehensive sexuality education to young people so that young people uh, are able to access the information early and then they are able to access the services that will prevent them from uh, having any unplanned or unwanted pregnancies. So okay. uh, I think this, this still remains to be um, one of our, the biggest issue that we need to tackle. Yeah, right. Because uh, another question from her was that uh, the IPPF Indonesia chapters have been active in providing family planning and SRHR services for Indonesian youth. But perhaps due to limited funding now, some clinics have closed their services. Mm -hmm. And it is hard for young people now in Indonesia to obtain uh, these services. Uh, and also FP and SRHR services, including contraceptive and safe abortion for youth are illegal in Indonesia at, mm -hmm. at, the, at the policy level. Mm -hmm. So, how is this affecting and is funding yes. a big problem right now? Uh, yes. 
I, I think, uh, and thank you very much for that question. And I think Indonesia is one country where we've seen um, that the donor shift has really impacted the country because uh, Indonesia had a very strong family planning program in the 1980s and 1990s. And um, I personally was in charge of some of the projects that we had there when donors were very much interested in Indonesia. But I think after 2004, 2005, and now in after 2010, the donors interests have shifted from this part of the world. And I think Indonesia is one of the countries where we have suffered and the lack of attention on family planning programs by the government has really impacted us very strongly. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Swapna Majumdar, a very senior journalist from India. She wants to know how can women in the region continue to be at the center of population and development? That's a very good question. Uh, I think um, when we talk about population and development, sometimes the, the discussion does go up, does yes. stray from having discussion on women, but we do need to ensure that uh, this is very tightly knit together so that the discussion on population and development <clears throat> is about women and about sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, I think we need to uh, also ensure that our politicians and our parliamentarians are very much aware of how we want to approach these issues and that they are very much, uh, they will speak the same language as we do. So we really need to work with parliamentarians and I feel perhaps this is an area that we could do more in the future and perhaps uh, platforms like the APC or SHR in the future could be platforms where we bring parliamentarians together and to talk about uh, population and development and SRHR. I think that's, uh, that's a very good uh, suggestion because we have parliamentarians caucuses for in other fields, uh, mm -hmm. for tuberculosis, even in the field of uh, 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 NCDs uh, and uh, so we need to have it here as well. I think mm -hmm. that's a very good suggestion. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Uh, Chin uh, Tho, a chief editor, Health Digest, Journal of Myanmar. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chin uh, is also part of APCAT Media Asia Pacific yeah. Regional Network. Mm -hmm. He says that childhood rape cases are increasing in Myanmar. Uh, mm -hmm. what to do about that. And I, I, and I think it's not only Myanmar to Moko, but even India, we are seeing mm -hmm. uh, an unprecedented rise in childhood rape and even very, very small girls, say even one or two years old or few months old are being raped. So, mm -hmm. and th this is a very disturbing uh, aspect. Yes. So what do we do about it? Or is uh, IPPF thinking of something on that? Yeah, so... Yes, thank you very much for that question. And it is quite appalling to know that it is the incidences of childhood rape is increasing in some of uh, our countries. Um, one, one thing that I could help, I think could help to reduce is perhaps to raise more awareness on the issue and also to try to collect data, for example, or raise, um, when we have issues like this and people tend to hide it and we don't want these kinds of problems to be known publicly. And uh, when we try to hide these issues, there is no way that we can tackle these issues openly and broadly. And it does take courage uh, sometimes. And, um, <clears throat> and most times our governments are not extremely happy to have issues be raised, but uh, I think raising awareness on the issue is has to be the first step to make known that these problems do exist in our community. And if we have um, stories, if we have data to support it, that will make our cause even stronger. And raising awareness, uh, it, I think, will definitely be the first step. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Uh, we have a question on Facebook by Dr. Bilkis Jahan. And she says that as non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cancers, etc., directly connect with SRH and risk factors for NCDs also link with SRHR issues, for example, tobacco use. Then are SRHR <laughs> organizations working with NCD organizations? Is there collaboration between them or there needs to be more collaboration? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, thank you very much for that because uh, NCDs is um, one of the rising, um, it is becoming one of the more bigger issues in our region actually in, in comparison to communicable diseases. And um, I took part in the, the Prince Mahidon conference last year, which was on NCDs. And there was a lot of discussion going on about how, uh, we in the health sector need to approach these problems. And uh, those of us working in SRHR is, is not an exception. Um, I think we are, um, one of the examples we have, uh, for example, uh, our member associations in the Pacific, um, the Pacific countries have high incidences of NCDs and it is widely recognized that that is uh, one of the clear health issues that need to be tackled. Um, so, for example, there has been collaboration between work on NCDs and SRHR, for example, uh, in SRHR service settings, services to, pro to uh, count the blood sugar level, for example, is provided, <clears throat> of course, um, uh, monitoring the blood pressure is always part of the services. Uh, one of the ways that we have been discussing is that um, SRHR interventions can tap on to an individual rather early on in life. For example, we start with young people. So this, they are just starting their journey of better health, for example. Um, also, we have contacts with pregnant women, and many of them are in their 20s, for example. So. Uh, SRHR interventions have the opportunity to link with people in the early stages of life. Uh, if we introduce uh, issues on NCDs uh, during these sessions, we have a possibility of impacting their health throughout their life cycle. So uh, I think uh, those of us working in SRHR have a kind of a niche in terms of the NCD. Um, but I think we still need to have more dialogues with the NCDs um, uh, sector and to find ways that we can actually collaborate. Actually, that part is still, it has still needs to be developed, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Tomoko, really, uh, I thank you for highlighting the issues of women, rather women inequality and access to SRHR in Japan because uh, mm. the world sees Japan as a big economic power and as a developed nation. Yes. And very often, uh, and uh, many others are ignorant like me, like we look up to Japan and their healthcare system and things like that. But what is lurking behind sometimes escapes the eye. So thank mm. you for highlighting that. Mm. And do you see such inequities in other rich nations too, also in the Asia Pacific? I think we have to look at inequities, not in terms of the traditional inequities of rural and urban. I think that was how we used to look at it. Those in the urban area are more um, have more access and those in the rural area do not. Or those who are rich have access and those who are poor do not. But mm -hmm. I think this access of looking at our inequalities is insufficient uh, in terms of how we are in Asia and the Pacific now. So um, rich people may still have no knowledge about SRHR or they may still be in a very traditional community where they are not able to come forward with regards to their sexual identity. Or uh, those in the urban areas may have a greater issue on SRHR than those in the rural areas. Um, because our countries have developed and there is some of the rural areas, it is not the same as 30 or 40 years ago where there was no electricity or there was no telephone lines. Now there are internet, 
even in the rural areas in many of the countries. So um, the issues in the urban area are much more perhaps those who are living in slum areas, those who are living in settlements that are uh, not legally or officially recognized by the government, for example. Uh, these areas may not have the access to government health services or education services that are there for other communities, for example. And this happens very much in an urban setting when people come from outside and, and settle within the urban areas. So I think there's a lot of inequalities that are residing in our urban areas or, or in our countries today that is not as simple as separating from urban, rural, or rich and poor anymore. Right, right, right. that's true. Um, uh, listeners, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or you can ask the questions yourself. Uh, we have a question from uh, Rahul Devedi from India, and he wants to know how do humanitarian crises uh, affect SRH services? Right now, we have the coronavirus crisis uh, uh, going on globally and uh, impacting conferences as well. And, uh, do you foresee or have has that impact on SRHR services being felt of such a crisis? Well, I think uh, the coronavirus it won't have a, a effect directly on uh, on SRHR, but um, SRHR in the humanitarian settings is definitely a key area that we need to focus on and make sure that um, SRHR is there in all responses of humanitarian aid, in terms of, for example, natural disasters or even post-conflict situations. We know that um, a lot of uh, rape or sexual waste, gender-based violence happens in many of these settings. Um, there are always pregnant women in these situations as well. Um, menstrual care needs to be there, even in these kinds of settings. So uh, there's a wide range of issues that a woman would face in terms of a humanitarian setting. Uh, and uh, many times these get tend to be neglected. So a lot of uh, the member associations in ITPF are now working with all governments, um, especially in, for example, Myanmar, Philippines, and Indonesia, where we have a specific focus and also all the Pacific uh, member associations we have there have a very good rapport with the government so that uh, in, in a, at times of a humanitarian crisis, uh, they are part of the local networking and a part of the conversation to ensure that SRHR services is there. Okay, and also extreme climate conditions, uh, uh, Tomoko. If there are extreme climate yes. conditions, they must also be affecting SRH services. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we have Jitima from Thailand who says it's good to hear reference to aging populations. Mm -hmm. So um, are the aging, uh, the sexual health needs of the aging population, are they being uh, addressed properly, uh, say, in a country like Japan or other countries of the region? Or... Uh, is stigma still there? Uh, uh, let us talk of the aging population first. Mm -hmm. So are we doing yes. enough to address that? Yes. So uh, I think um, I think there is there is not yet being enough being done in terms of the aging population. Um, uh, we we have sort of um, well discussions on infertility has always been there in, in Japan, for example, but uh, a lot has been to the extreme in terms of um, very expensive infertility treatments, which is like uh, infertility services that are up here, but actually there is a, a long, there are many different steps that can be taken before you reach that point. And uh, perhaps uh, work in this area is something that we have sort of uh, neglected or not looked at in the past. And this is not only for um, rich countries, I don't think. It, infertility is an issue for women in, in many countries. And some 
in some countries, uh, women are stigmatized if they're not able to have children. And there are women who go through uh, a lot of pain and psychological suffering because they are not able to have children, but perhaps caring for these women, uh, this, this is kind of areas that we have not looked at in the past. So yes, in terms of the aging population, uh, we do need to sort of look at SRHR in terms of not, not only preventing, but also supporting women who wish to have uh, children. But this we have not yet done uh, so much in, in this region, I don't think. And one of the uh, key issues here is that uh, when governments have faced the issue of the aging population, the first thing they will say to you is, um, can you help us to, have, to, have, to let women to have more children? So that is the very danger that it will, we are pushed into uh, this goes totally against a choice. It is about uh, women should not be have to. It is about making their own choices, so they should not be forced to be having children or not to be having children. This should be about her choice and her about her own body. But the issue when it goes to the when the governments have an aging society they tend to ask people to try to help people to have more children and they will have, um, they will come up with ways, for example, subsidizing a woman to receive some funds if they have their second child or a third child, um, reducing tax, for example, if you have more children or ways to promote women to have children. So. Uh, I think uh, we need to be very careful when we move into uh, working in an aging society. So uh, we have Padam Raj Joshi, a very senior journalist from uh, Nepal. If the funding cut from US has impacted SRS services and impacted IPPF's work? Yes, um, it has. Uh, the cut from US has definitely impacted SRH services globally. Um, I think it has impacted more the IPPF member associations in Africa region and not so much here in this region, uh, specifically because, for example, countries like Cambodia, um, before we, our member association in Cambodia, the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, who is hosting this ABC or SHR, they used to receive a big funding from USAID, but when the global gag rule came in, they would lose all the funding from USAID and it jeopardized their existence. So they, uh, from that experience, they had uh, taken steps to uh, reduce their dependency on USAID and now they don't receive any funding from USAID. So uh, a lot of the member associations in our region have shifted from depending on USAID uh, funding. So it has not impacted us greatly here in, uh, in this region. But because USAID funding supports a lot of family planning and SRA services, uh, a lot also by uh, US NGOs and all of those, and a lot of in Africa, the international NGOs in Africa, I think uh, a lot of them had to be cut a lot of clinics had to be um, closed. So for example, in Zambia or in Kenya, those are the countries that uh, had a much bigger impact from the US funding cut. I, I was very impressed from my side of comment about uh, your talking of that economic development has not gone hand in hand with empowerment of women and with uh, improvement in SRH services. I, I think that is a very important point you raised, uh, Tomoko. And mm -hmm. also we find sometimes that the right-wing governments in many countries, uh, I feel they are mm -hmm. pushing back the agenda yes. around yes. SRHR issues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is very disturbing. That's a, that's a very disturbing sign. Yes. Because uh, very recently we had a news in India about, uh, we are talking about menstruation and about young girls and their SRH rights and 
it was in one of the hostels <coughs> excuse me of a girls college uh, in gujarat where the girls were made to strip to uh, sh to show whether they are menstruating or not inside mm -hmm. them i do not know if you read that news and of course later on the principal of the college was suspended but like they have rules that during menstruation the girls should not mix with others they should not go to the kitchen so these uh, things still abound uh, and you were talking of when you were talking of aging population you said women are stigmatized if they do not produce a child in india women are stigmatized still if they do not produce a son forget yeah. about a child if they don't produce a son they are still stigmatized yes exactly so mm. how do, what do we do about these things and uh, it's very good that you have raised these issues i think uh, these are very important issues and uh, women need to get together more and uh, work on it yes i think uh, a lot of the issues we are talking about relate to our culture or yes. social norms and a lot of it is also linked very much to tradition or how things have been done over generations and uh, i think uh, a key is for young for women to come together and um to form groups and community based groups or local groups and also to make uh, coalitions at the national level and to ensure that voices of women are raised and are delivered to parliamentarians delivered to governments and uh, i think there there are so many different platforms now where we can raise our voice and uh, some of the things that i think we do need to do is to work more with the uh, the women's gender groups and feminist groups um because srhr has been so much on health issues uh we have been sort of comfortable with the health sector but, but and we haven't had so much uh, partnerships with the women's empowerment groups for example or gender equality groups so i think srhr really needs to come hand in hand with women's groups and that this needs to be done at different levels and if we do join forces and raise our voice together it will uh, these are the ways that we change social norms or we change traditions then i think the role of media is a very a powerful one um when we have uh issues and voices of such women in the media for example and it is made known widely to the public i think that is how we start to generate a change within society and uh, of course the young people also need to be they're the ones who will form our generation in the future so voices from the young people and empowering them to also come forward with their views on how they see how srhr should be in their countries yes very right and dialogue is very important to more quite mm -hmm. because i have been speaking to very many uh, very uh, elderly women in india some of whom who are not literate also and talking mm -hmm. about these cultural and social issues and mm -hmm. many said we don't like them we don't believe in them but we do mm -hmm. not have the strength to speak out openly against them mm -hmm. yes. so i think dialogue is important and women are realizing very often they are somehow inhibited in uh, uh, saying mm -hmm. what what they actually feel is right yes yes exactly okay we have a comment on from on facebook mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, an idea with regards to the appalling issue of rise in instances of child rape maybe apcr shr platform can develop an initiative such as that of the me too initiative movement and be the voice of these voiceless child victims in raising the profile of this issue mm -hmm. and putting the heat directly on to perpetrators who can and need to influence the change mm -hmm. this is uh, this comment is by lono Uh, Lenuto. Mm -hmm. That's so, a very good suggestion. I think um, conferences like this gives us an opportunity to think of ways that we can uh, raise our voice. And using social media is definitely something that we could do together, um, okay. and an initiative that could be started at the conference. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay i think we have already overshot the time but it was such an enriching conversation 
um, Tomoko, and thank you for yes. that. And uh, friends, in this third episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we were listening to Ms. Tomoko Fukodo, Regional Director of International Planned Parenthood Federation for East and Southeast Asia and Oceania region. And APCR SHR 10 Dialogues is a special series of fortnightly online interviews with leaders from Asia Pacific on the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific. 2030 SDGs vision and 2020 realities. And this is also the theme of APCR SHR 10. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10 and CNS, these online interviews are streamed live every fortnight from February to May 2020 in the lead up to the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights to be held in Cambodia. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues. And thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.